Bala, I uh, am a professional storyteller. I'm a communications coach for people, and I've been doing that for almost 30 years now. Uh, I think what's important to point out is that I'm a storyteller, not a PowerPointer. PowerPoint for me is something that just tells people about what you're talking about. It's not the end all, be all, and the, should be the center point of uh, what goes on. Part of my role in the tech community right now, although I've done tech support for uh, all kinds of different organizations and uh, the state of Arizona and uh, places like uh, Arizona Highways Magazine, what have you. Right now, I'm uh, basing a lot of my work out of Gangplank Avondale, and I coordinate the brown bags for um, those afternoon sessions. And so that's really kind of my goal today, is kind of to present to you kind of a quick, easy, simple workshop talking about how do you, uh, how, how, how do you communicate with uh, people that, that uh, you said a moment ago, that call you and go, what is Times New Roman? And this is the questions that we think, wow, you know, everybody should know this stuff. Aren't, aren't they supposed to automatically know this? Uh, I do know it's a law of two feet here today, so if you get up and leave, that's fine. If the room empties out, I'm going to keep talking because this thing is streaming. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. I'm going to talk in the room no matter who's in here. I am a storyteller, so that's where we begin. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack, and his mother said to him, Jack, you are old enough now. It is time for you to go out and seek your fortune. Now, Jack wasn't the wisest young man on the planet, as many young men often are not, but uh, he did the best that he could. So he made his way out, and he... He, he traveled for some distance until he came to a farm. Well, they went to the farm, and he, he asked if there was work to be done, the owner of the farm. The farmer said, yes, of course, uh, I will employ you, and at the end of the day, I will give you your wages. So Jack worked the entire day for the farmer, and when he got to the end of the day, the man paid him in two silver coins, which he put in Jack's hand, and Jack carried those coins back home to give to his mother, as he had been instructed, just walking along the river trying to get to his home. But as he walked along the river, he looked at those coins, and they were smooth and flat, and they just, just looked like the rocks he would skip. So he took those coins, and he, he skipped those rocks over the river. When he got home, he told his mother what he had done and said, Oh, mother, I took those. And she said, Oh, Jack, Jack, when someone pays you your wages, you take them and you stick them in your pocket. That's what you do when somebody pays you. Jack said, Mama, I'm going to try to remember that. So when he gets back to the next day to the home and the farmer pays his wages, he says, Jack, I, I don't have any coins for you today. But what I have for you is this container of milk. So take this home and share it with your mother. So Jack did what his mother had said, and he took that milk, and just like she had said, he poured it into his pockets. Because that's what she said, you put it in your pockets. So when he got home, following the river home, his pockets were empty, his clothes were wet. He told his mother what happened, and she said, oh, Jack, Jack, Jack. When someone pays you your wages, you don't stick them in your pocket like that. You, you balance them on your head and you bring them home. That's how you do that, Jack. What's wrong with you? So the next day, he goes back. He works all day long. The farmer says, Jack, not in coins today, not in milk today. What you're going to get today is this beautiful wheel of cheese. You take this cheese, you go back home to your mother, you share it, you both enjoy it. So Jack did what his mother had said. He took that cheese, he stuck it on his head, and he began to walk home. But the day was hot. The cheese began to melt. So by the time he got home, the cheese was melted all over his body. He looked like fondue. His mother said, Jack, 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 no, no, no. When someone pays you your wages, you take those wages, you stick them inside a sack, and then on your way home, you dip that sack in the water to keep it cool. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Jack said, OK, Mama, I'm going to remember. So he went back to work. The farmer said, you know, not today in coins, not today in milk, not today in cheese, but you know what I'm going to give you today? I'm going to pay you with this cat. This cat is the finest mouser out there. This is the cat you want. Now, Jack remembered what his mother had said, so he took that cat, he stuck it in the burlap sack, and as he walked along the river, he dumped that sack in the water to keep it cool, just like his mother had said. And so when he got home and opened the sack, the cat came out and scratched him and bit him, and he was all bloody. He said to his mama, Mama, I did what you said. She said, Jack, oh, Jack, Jack, Jack. Now, when someone pays you your wages like that, you tie a string around it, and then you walk, you walk back to home with it dragging behind you. That's how you do that, Jack. OK, Mama, I'm going to remember. So he goes back to work. The farmer this time doesn't pay him in coins, not milk, not cheese, not cat. But this time, he pays him in a huge piece of ham. 
Jack, take this home and feed it to your mother. Let you and your mother eat this. Jack said, okay, I will. So he takes that ham, he ties a string around it, and he drags it back through town, just like his mama had told him to do. But as he did it, all the cats and the dogs came and ate that ham. So when he got home, he had a little tiny ham bone left. That's all he had. Look, mama, I did what you said. Oh, Jack. Jack, no. When you get paid your wages like that, you take those wages, and you stick them on your shoulders, and you carry it home that way, Jack. What's wrong with you? <coughs> so the next day, he goes to work. The man said, this is the last day I can employ you, Jack. I don't have any more work for you, but I'm going to give you a big gift, a big payment today. I'm going to give you and your mama this donkey. This donkey, <laughs> right there. This donkey is your wages. So he did what he was told. He took those and he stuck that huge donkey on his shoulders and he made his way back to where he lived. But each and every day when Jack had been returning home, he had to pass in front of the house of the woman who had never laughed. And she would look out the window each and every day, never laughing at all. But this time, when Jack came through, having seen him with cheese and milk and cats, this time when Jack came through with that donkey on his shoulders, she laughed so hard that everyone in the town turned and looked at her laughing, and then turned and looked at Jack, who was carrying the donkey on her shoulders, and she laughed and she laughed and she laughed. She came down out of the house, she said to Jack, Jack, you were the first person to ever make me laugh. Will you be my husband? And Jack said, yes, I will. And what you don't know about the woman who never laughed is she was wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. And so Jack took some of that wealth and he shared it with his mama. And from that day forward, Jack and the woman who never laughed, who now did, lived happily ever after and not one single day ever again did Jack have to worry about where to put his wages? And that, my friends, is the story of Food with Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, <laughs> what we're going to do, we're going to come back to Jack a little bit. We're going to talk about communicating. Sometimes when we want to communicate something, what we think we're saying, what we think is helpful, really isn't helping people at all. We'll come back to uh, maybe what Jack's mom could have done better with this. Specifically today, I want to talk in just this really brief session is about how do you communicate to these great ideas that we all have, these things that we know, the secrets that we know. Ah, 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 ah. How do we communicate those things to our clients and customers? So I'm really talking that. I know you had mentioned that you do some tech support, so you've definitely got clients and you've definitely got customers and people you see and don't see, and you have a wide variety. We all have people that we need to interact with. Um, most of the technology people that I'm working with really are coming out of uh, trying to have small businesses and what have you, so that's kind of the direction that we're going to talk about today. I suggest that no matter what you are trying to communicate, that you wrap what you are trying to do in the context of story. In other words, what are the results of the technology you're trying to share? Unless you're at a conference like this, where everyone else around you is a god from Cupertino, you know, it's a god from Redmond, that we are gods and goddesses of wisdom and knowledge, and we speak this language that we speak to each other, this secret code. Most of the people that you encounter outside of the sacred grounds of the work that we do, when we have to go back down the mountain to mere mortals, they don't speak our language at all. And you know what? They don't care about our language. They don't, they don't care about the difference between MP3 and MP4. They don't care. What they want is results. And so what we need to learn to do as tech people is to talk about results. And you talk about results in the context of story. You talk about results in the context of story. The more esoteric your work, the more you need story to carry the knowledge that you have. Because people will say to me all the time, I work in IT, I work in accounting. I don't need to talk about stories for anything. Yes, we do. The more esoteric your work to the real world out there, the more that people need to have your stuff in, in the context of story. I was doing a presentation in Evanston, Illinois, in the north, really the north part of Chicago. <coughs> and I had this presentation where this company decided that they were going to have the whole company learn to do the latest fad, which is storytelling. I've been around some storytelling was not a fad, now it's a fad, I'll be here when it's done. But that was it. The whole company was going to learn storytelling. So they gathered all the people from this company everywhere, the janitors, the IT, the president, everybody, the marketing department, who was the only people that were happy. 
We banded all these people. I started my presentation. We started the first part of the presentation. Then during the break, I went into the bathroom. And in the bathroom, I was behind a door. Do I need to say more? Are you with me? Okay, I was behind a door, right? So that's where I am. And as I'm behind the door, the two of the people walk in, and they, other guys, and they start doing whatever their business is, which wasn't behind the door. And when they're done, they're washing their hands, and they're talking. The whole time they're talking, one of the guys is livid. He's crazy. He's like, this speaker sucks. I was a speaker. <laughs> he was totally fried. He was like, this speaker sucks. Why do I need storytelling? This is such a waste of time. Why are we here? I got things to do. The world was ending. So when I was done uh, behind the door and opened the door, like they're there, and I opened the door and I stepped out and they can see me in the mirror. So the two guys are the guy who's yelling and the other guy, the guy who's just listening to him, just kind of goes <laughs> and walks out the door. Meanwhile, I go up to there and I wash my hands because I had been behind the door. And this guy's just like, <laughs> I mean, he's just like, you know, regenerating, you know, it was terrible. It was like zombie. <laughs> and I, so I said to him, I said, man, that speaker sucks, huh? He goes, well, I don't know about the speaker sucks, but he said, I don't need to be here. What are we doing storytelling for? This doesn't make any sense to me. I said, oh, I said, okay. That's fine. I, you know, my ego is not so shallow that it's like, oh, you didn't like me? <laughs> okay, all right. So I said, well, yeah, okay, so what do you do here? And he says, he says, uh, we're in charge of buildings. I, I secure the buildings. There's some fancy word for it, but I don't know. And I said, buildings, huh? And I said, so what's the best building you guys ever got in this company? This company was a company that worked for uh, elder care. So everything from people who are really self-reliant to, to nursing homes. He said, we bought this building once where families with Alzheimer's patients could come and meet, and the center was a big place where they could have picnics. He says, people come to this building and they, have, they rebuild their families. These Alzheimer's patients have a place to go. It's not like a clinical. People love this building. They tell us all the time. He's going on and on and on. And I said, oh, I really have really clean hands by this time. So I said, okay. I said, you know what? I said, I think that's the best story I've ever heard about a building. You're a great storyteller. To which point, <laughs> he looks at me, <laughs> swears at me, and walks out of the room. Now, from that point forward, as much of the cliche as it sounds, he was one of the most attentive people. Because part of this is, is putting things in the context of story. So I blew in with the technical knowledge I have about communication. He didn't understand where it was. But as soon as we could put his work in the context of story, it suddenly made sense to him. As soon as he, because guess what? People don't spend money on buildings. They spend money on what happens because of what happens in the building. Because of the story of Alzheimer's families, that's what people fund. For you and I, it's stuff like this. Critics don't want, if you're a web designer, people don't want pretty sites and high tech. They say that? They say, oh, I, I want a really advanced site. They say that, but the average non-tech people Mr. and Mrs. Jones running, you know, the candle, scented candle shop. They say high tech to you, I want the latest. But they don't. What they want is success from their site. So when we go in and we say, well, you know, we can use the latest HTML5, which is probably wrong now, huh? Isn't it? Is it HTML6 now? I don't even know. See, it's how far I'm behind. So <coughs> we go in and we say, tech words, tech words, tech words, tech words. And what do they do? Yeah. Okay. However, then when you produce a site, with everything you said you were going to do, and they look at it and they go, uh, okay, but how do I put the new candles on? They, they don't want, what they want is this. They want success from the site. So when we go in and we talk to people about what we're going to do for them, we talk to them about what the success is. We say, you know what? I can build you the fanciest site you want. Let me tell you some examples of what you might want to use. I have a client who does X, and when they started with me, and we built this, now they sell 7,100 million Xs. That's what they want. They don't care how you're going to get there. They, they want the story. They want to know what goes on. If you work in an organization where you are the IT team, everyone's afraid of you. They're already afraid of you. They're like, oh my god, not the IT people. No! Okay. When you go in and you say, we have to buy a new OS. Now, those of us in the room who are technology, we know that stands for operating system. Thank you very much. At least I think it does. Did I do it right? Clients don't want a new OS. When you go in and say, we have to buy the next I don't, what's Mac on now? Leopard, Sphinx, Armadillo, whatever they're on now, okay? So we go in and we say, we have to buy the latest. 
They don't fund that. When you go to the, to the accounting people and you say, we need the latest, they don't get it. What they get, though, is the story of how that OS will build the bottom line. When you say, this company down the road did this improvement to their OS, and their bottom line grew by 15%, the accounting people are going to go, how much money would you like? Do you see what I'm saying? We get caught up sometimes in our great technology. But the people that we're serving, they just want results. And those results are talked about in story. Talk about how XYZ company achieved great things because of what you think should be done. And that's, that's where the sales come from. That's where the conversion comes from. PowerPoint doesn't sell stuff unless it's got great stories on it. Now again, when we're talking to each other, it's a different world. But when we're talking to real human beings, it's different. We have to learn to focus on what people actually want. Now having coordinated a lot of technology presentations before, and also doing the brown bags at Gangplank Avondale, I've learned that people come in to an event with their presentation ready, but they haven't thought about what does the audience need. So one of the first things that we need to, to look at is what do they need? So Jack's mother is telling Jack how to solve his immediate problem. But Jack had a bigger problem. Jack's problem wasn't about where do you put the wages. Jack's problem was not knowing how to think about the wages, right? From that first story we talked about. So his problem wasn't where do I put the coins. His problem was what do I do when people pay me? She kept answering the questions she wanted to answer. Put it on your head, put it in your pocket, put it over your shoulders, tie a string to it. She wanted to answer that question. And sometimes from a technical point, that's what we want to do. We want to walk in and answer the questions we want to answer versus saying, what does the audience really want first? What do they really want from us first? What is the information, what is the information she, that, 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 uh, that she wants? She, she didn't ask him, she just told him. And we do this sometimes in technology education. So, so what's the steps to this? I want you to think for a moment about one presentation you have to give. Just get that thought in your brain for a moment. What's a, what's a technology presentation you have to give? Common questions you might have to answer, for example, what you were talking about earlier. You get that thought in your brain for just a moment? What's a presentation you have to give? Now, moving from you have this Olympic size, godlike, goddess like knowledge. What do the people who hear your presentation really want to know? What do they really want to know? Is anyone willing to answer that question out loud? <laughs> right now, is anyone willing to answer that question? What is the presentation you do? And what do you think people really want to know from your presentations? Anybody, please? Solutions. Solutions. What, what, where did they come from? What subject matter do you, are you? I'm not IT at all, so I'm, somebody else can answer that. Okay. So it doesn't apply for you. Well, actually, you know what? Because we're, talk yeah, we're talking IT, but it really across, uh, across stuff. I mean, my work, my work is in storytelling, and I know that I come here with 30 years of storytelling knowledge, and if I come in with a workshop and say, I'm just going to drop all this of what I think you need to know, you know, solutions is what they want, so it even still applies even though it's not technology. So they want solutions. They want, they want, to, they want to solve their problem. They want to be in less pain <laughs> over whatever it is they do. Anybody else? What, what's your, what's they, your? They want to know what they need to do. What's their part of the project? That's right. They that's they that's want really. to get the benefits out of this. I mean, for example, um, next week I'm teaching a, um, a group of older adults on uh, Twitter, how to use Twitter. Right. So, uh, of course, I can talk about all the bells and whistles right. of Twitter, and, but they don't care about that. Right. What they care is, okay, how can I find my grandson, granddaughter on Twitter? Exactly. Exactly. Um, how can I, or, or they probably don't know yet about that, but how they can find um, discounts or coupons and, um, right. Uh, right. from the restaurant or store or something like that. So exactly. exactly. This is what they right. need. Right, and just repeating for the camera a little bit of what you've said, you're talking about teaching Twitter, and it's not about platforms, it's not about, you know, here's the hundred different ways you can do it, here's who's sweet, they don't want to know all that. They want to, how do I talk to, as you said, how do I talk to my grandson, how do I resolve, you know, how do I find things that are going to help me. We went so fast, could you repeat what you had said for me, please? Oh, um, they want to know what their part 
is, what's expected of them. You're presenting something usually as a, a partial solution for right. something, but they also have a responsibility in it. Right. They want to know what do I need to do. Right. To right. So we come in, they, they want to know what their, I'm again repeating for the, the camera, they want to know what their, their part is and what their role is. That is completely true. Uh, I don't do a lot of tech design, but every now and then for fellow artists, I kind of help them at least come into the 1990s in their website. I mean, so if that's my technology level. And so I can get to the point where I can help them at least get something running on WordPress. I mean, I can do that. But then, but then they, they're not ready to do anything. So my real thing for them is, okay, I can build your site, but unless you write me some articles, unless we make some videos, I have nothing. And it's the same with the old people on Twitter. Exactly. Um, they got to learn that they, you know, they have to actively follow and do things. They can't set it up one time and then watch it like right. after an MDV. Yeah. It's, an, it's interactive. Yeah, Twitter's not, Twitter's not magic. So the first thing is start with their needs and not your knowledge. This is hard for us that have knowledge. It's hard for us to be the gods, Cupertino gods. It's hard. So start with what they need first. This, this alone will change your presentation. People will go from from just being intimidated by you, what did he say? Okay, to actually being engaged with you, just on just on this piece alone. Step two: translate your knowledge to a story that answers what the need is. Translate your knowledge to that. Now, the guy in the bathroom who was yelling at me, I could have given him a hundred reasons why his organization needs better communication skills, but I turned it right back on him and I pulled his story out of him. So that I went from, I'm here to dig you up storytelling in your nonprofit organization to what are you going to do tomorrow with what I'm telling you right now. So I translated directly into his need. So if you are going and teaching about uh, video workshops, or you're teaching people how to use video, don't talk about way up here in a hundred different platforms for video. We know they're all out there. Talk to them about what they can do tomorrow so that their grandchildren can see them or that their employees can see their, their daily message. Talk directly about their needs. That's step two. Step three, frame your facts in the story. When I do presentations with IT and tech people, they start to say, yeah, but facts are important. I am 100% with you. Facts are absolutely incredible. Story does not replace facts. The stories that you tell, they frame those facts. They let you pick something up in a, in a bowl, in a frame, and carry that information so that people can remember them. Story surrounds the facts. Never am I saying you should do storytelling instead of telling people facts. People need to know that YouTube is free and, I don't know, the mail or something is not. Okay? They, they need to know some facts about this. They need to know that, that uh, you, can't just, you can't just take your, your photographs on film and suddenly they're going to appear matching on the computer. They need to know that there's a reason that you put them on, on cameras now with, with, uh, uh, you know, with, with discs on them and what have you. Believe me, people still are using film. <laughs> and some, they're like, why are we still doing this? The story frames and carries those facts. Step four, match the level of your facts to the knowledge of your audience. Here's where we fall into trouble. You speak a language, we speak a language about the work that we do, regardless of the work, whether it's technology or not. We have jargon, and we're so used to using the jargon that we forget that the people in the chairs don't think about this all day long. I could be telling you about the Aaron Thompson types of stories that I'm telling you today, and that would mean nothing to you. And that's great that I have that knowledge, but you don't need to know that. But if I tell you, remember that story about the, the Jack story I told you about Jack being foolish? There's lots of stories like that. Now suddenly you have a frame for that. When I say maybe you can find a Jack story, you're like, oh, I've heard a Jack story. I get it, okay? Here's what, unless your mother is a technology wizard, and now some mothers are, right? <laughs> okay? Here's what I ask you. As you go through your presentation, and you're listening to yourself prepare, and you're looking at your notes, say, would my mother understand this? Would my great aunt Sally understand this? If they wouldn't, then you're using too much jargon. And if your mother won't understand it, it's possible that the people in the seats won't understand it. When they don't understand it, they'll either challenge you and say, wait, what, which is rare, by the way, or they'll be intimidated by the technology and go, okay, I'm just going to back off because I should know what that is, right? Or they're going to completely walk out of the room saying, that was the worst presentation I've ever seen. Jargon. Jargon is jargon. Speak clearly. Would your mother get, unless, again, she's a tech wizard, would your mother get this? Step five, and it's almost, it's almost a cliche. 
<laughs> Step five, and I say this with respect to my brothers and sisters in the technology world, we have to be nice to people. We have to be nice to people. Because somewhere in the world, the people that you are talking to in the seats who don't know uh, YouTube from a flute, they don't know anything, they have no idea, those people in the seats know something about something that would make you look the fool. Okay? They know something about something. And something that they do is a gift and talent to the world. Maybe it's carrying a donkey on their shoulders and making the woman who never laughed laugh. They have a talent that you and I can't touch. I think we need to be gentler with our audiences and understand that it is an honor and privilege to bring the small people of the world up the mountain. Do you understand what I'm saying here? We just have to be nice to people, and sometimes that's hard. You had a great example earlier talking about somebody asking about a font question, which is like from 1982. I mean, I'm with you. I'm totally with you. But there's people like that that, that just... I had to explain it to him three times. <laughs> and eventually it resolved to... What's, what's a font? What's a font? See, that's what I mean. It's getting down to what's the real question there, Carrie. You know, they say, well, what, does, what does New Times New Roman mean? They really want to know, you know, oh, a font is a way that the, that the, that the letters look. You know what I mean? I mean, and, and, I, and I know sometimes that, that we say, oh, we're getting better as a tech community, but I'm going to tell you that if you go to Twitter on any given day, and I knew this would happen, I prepared this, last, this slide last night, if you go to Twitter on any given day, somebody's going to be snarking about the mere mortals of the world. It happened here yesterday. Now, does this mean that the person who posted this is a bad human being? No, he's probably a thousand times smarter than I am. Okay, but, but we do this. We get mad at people. We're like, wait a minute, you didn't use the right word. <laughs> okay, hold on. We'll get them there. But the people that are in front of you, they're going to mess up words. Just be nice to people. And know that the mortals that you present to, whether it's your grandmother or it's the school principals or whatever, they want you to do well. They, they brought you in front of them so that they could learn something. They don't sit back and go, oh, God, I hope this sucks. They don't do that. They're like, oh my God, give me knowledge. <laughs> give me information. You know, how do I talk to my kids on Facebook or Twitter or my grandchildren? They want knowledge and information from you. So step five, be nice. And I know that's slightly preachy, but I think you might be with me on this. I think you understand what I'm talking about. We all get snarky all the time. I, I mean, I, I can tell you just from my work and knowing events like this that the word story and storytelling has been misused at least a dozen times in this conference. I guarantee it. I guarantee that people walk around and go, yeah, we're all about storytelling. No, you're not. You're not even close to storytelling. Now, could I be snarky and bitchy about that and Twitter it? Yes, I could. Am I going to? No, because I've learned my lesson. <laughs> all right? All right, the mortals want you, the mortals want you to do well. Um, I'll give you a moment for questions on this. This is my contact information. Uh, I do offer free initial coaching for people who are trying to learn to speak things. Uh, I have resources on Kindle, books, and workshops. I'm not selling you anything. That's my contact information. Um, before we end up with the last slides, questions, thoughts, ideas, complaints, anything? How do you, how do you, or can you give any advice on structuring a talk for um, either mixed levels of audience, so uh, an audience that has from beginner to advanced, like, that sort of thing, or, and or audiences that are either beginner or intermediate advanced, that sort of right. thing. Right, right. Uh, the question, again, repeating for the camera, the question is advice on mix, mixed uh, talent levels, mixed uh, experience levels. Mm -hmm. The first thing to do is to acknowledge that really clearly, because you're in charge when you give a presentation. It's, it's you. So the first thing is you acknowledge, you say, look, I know in this room we have 50% of you that, that already know most of this, and I have 30% of you who've never done this at all. And so do you acknowledge that? You put it out there so people can't say, he didn't cover this or he was talking too low. You acknowledge it. You say, this is the deal. Uh, I would also, regardless of what the, the people who have brought you in, whether it's your own company or other, have said to you, I would, I would poll the audience right there. And I would say, how many of you really know this? <laughs> and they'll put their hand up. Now, also know that, that half of the people who say they really know it don't have a clue. Okay? They pretend knowledge, but that's fine. But then say, how many of you are, and I, just, I play with people, how many of you are scared to death of what this fat guy's going to say? Okay, you know, I just tell them, you know, and some kind of people are like, oh, thank God, yes, I'm frightened of you. <laughs> you know, so, you, so that you actually know what your facts are from there. Um, and, and then as you do things, and if you are, if you're a big PowerPoint person, put both facts up on the wall. 
and say, for those of you who are here, do this. But for those people that are that, that 50% who already know it, don't spend a lot of time on them. You know, you're not necessarily responsible for that group. You acknowledge that they're there. You say, here's what you know. By the way, here's an advanced thing that you 50% might want to do. And you give them, you give them a resource, a link, a something. You say, here's where you go. Now, for those of you who are new at this, let me let me walk you through this quick. So you acknowledge it, you pull the audience, and then you you, you throw bones to the people who get it, and then you you make sure that you stay with that that other percentage of mere mortals that aren't quite ready yet. Does that help at all? Does that make sense for you? Yeah. Cool. Good. Uh, anything else? Any other thoughts or questions or anything? Uh, I want to tell you about something that's coming up. One of the best ways to uh, to learn to um, to speak better is to have more opportunities to do it. Uh, we are promoting a new thing in the West Valley uh, called the Small Biz Storytelling Slam. Think of it as Ignite Phoenix without the technology. Uh, it's five minutes of what your story is. It's a contest. It's fabulous, fabulous prizes and eternal glory when you win this contest. So if you're interested in that, that's the flyer that's right here. It's a good opportunity to, to, to manage your speaking skills in a non-threatening environment. Is look at things like story slams and stuff like that. Arizona is a hotbed for storytelling across the board. We, we are one of the, the nation's leadership in how storytelling is built in this country. Uh, there's a South Mountain Community College, which has a, uh, a certificate program in storytelling. Uh, I've been in the Valley doing Storyteller.net longer than Google has been alive. Uh, we're one year older than Google. I know. Um, so we've been doing this for quite a while. There's a ton of stuff. The, the Arizona Republic now does regular story slams as well. So my thing to you is, is that get in front of mere mortals more often with just your stories and working through developing your stories. And it's OK if you're not really good the first time, because you've got to be bad at something. I'm sorry. But it's really, you, know, you get started, and you get experience and stuff like that. So come and join those <coughs> experiences as, as you might be interested. So anyway, that's the flyer is here uh, for that as well. And I think that takes us through that. So anything else before we wrap up? <clears throat> What's the format of this? You said without the technology. So is it more like the moth? Oh, yeah. If you speak that language, yeah, it's more like the moth, yes. Um, what happens is is that you can come as an audience or come as a speaker. Everybody comes as the audience. If you've got a story prepared on the theme, the theme for December is it actually happened. Now, you can fit that theme any way you want as long as you're in that theme. So you decide that. Uh, people who want to tell, they throw their name in the hat, whatever the hat is. We pull eight to ten names out randomly. Those eight to ten people do five-minute stories. You get a one-minute grace period. If you go at 601, I will mock you unmercilessly and throw you off the stage. <laughs> so you want to have five-minute stories. Uh, and then the audience votes on who they thought was the best story. And that is when you win eternal glory and whatever prizes I am giving you at that point. <laughs> so that's what that is. You may get drawn, you may not. So yeah, it's very close to the moth model if you want to, if you want to use that. Moth is a slam. It's not a poetry slam, so you're not reading stories. It's not Ignite Phoenix, so you're not doing this. And that's, by the way, I love Ignite Phoenix. I think it's great. However, it's a different model. It's a different way of looking at it. So, Good. Well, thank you very much. I, I, I'm delighted that you stayed uh, so I didn't have to speak alone to a room. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'm doing a thing on, on how creatives can survive technology. That's when I handhold all the other artists and go, kumbaya, <laughs> WordPress won't kill you. Uh, so that'll, <laughs> I'm doing that, doing that at 11. So thank you very much, and I will see you guys later. <laughs> Word press is not the enemy. <laughs> is that that's later today? <laughs> that's at eleven, yeah. At eleven, oh okay. IT people are human too. <laughs> <laughs> <Excuse me. coughs> so I'm speaking about Word press at eleven as well. Well there you go. <laughs> You'll be in the other room. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of just excellent uh, stuff going on here. I, I couldn't make it yesterday because I was performing in like San Diego Bend, but um, there was so much stuff. I'm delighted that there's some streaming. That was a, like an extra gift. Mm. Yay! So, hi, I'm going to turn you off now. Bye. So. Have you heard the, uh, I don't know what school it was, but the commencement address by Robert Crowich? Mm -mm. I recommend it. Uh, you can find it online, probably through radio. Sure. But that was the whole, he spent an hour saying that to the kids. You're coming out of school and you know all these wonderful things, but it's useless unless you can communicate it. And the way to communicate it 
is through story. Yeah. And you're familiar with it, I'm sure, with the. Uh, yeah, I know of. I don't know a lot of stuff, but, yeah, but I haven't and seen and it yet. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll look that up. Uh, I'll find it and tweet it to you. Yeah, would you please? That would be great. Um, oh, okay. I was about to say. So that would be uh, how do you spell Robert? You got a US Robert 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 Robert, right? uh, no, K R U L. Free gifts. I love free gifts. Free gifts. Free gifts. Free gifts. Yeah, he's coming to the radio. Uh, okay. And I could open um, He's <laughs> also. Uh, <laughs> that's the best part. <laughs> Science correspondent. <laughs> I feel like I feel like what goes okay. in the flash drive yeah, part of that needs to be yeah, in the radio part of the beer opening. Not off the top of my head. So like maybe you could start a database shop there. It's, uh, well, it's, it's in PR. You know, so. Okay, but, but it's not. Either that or your not, home address. Not oh, 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 they didn't get it. You missed things. You probably didn't drive. You probably didn't drive. Hi, I, I live I here. I think. Where? Oh, I live there. Oh, that's right. It's yeah. one big Google yeah. map. Yeah. And they're not <laughs> So the old ones are just as good as the new ones. Oh, I love it. I have some. Cool. My favorite is. Why do I know your name from school? What is it? The Tech of the Story. It's one from the first season. Yeah, this hell is one piece of uh, around uh, I'm one of those notorious individuals. The goat is talking on the cow. And they were driving down the road and they noticed this. Uh, they stopped to look at it. All over and here, all these other two are over there. And probably that it's uh, receptors we outsourced to colleges. Radio Lab. Um, oh. Part of Phoenix Oktoberfest. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Okay. What's interesting is thing like this is that you see all these people that you. That you, that you know, <laughs> Brian, my name, and by, by handle. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, that's yeah. who you are. <laughs> I got to follow you on Twitter. But I don't I know who you are. Hey, 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 Friends of the original Nintendo. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and like, yeah, uh, yeah. I'm friends oh, with uh, the lady doing the podcast downstairs. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Cindy? Because I got CJ. 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 Sure. Yeah. Stuck yeah. Yeah. I was, I was at least had a letter right, so that's all good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what? And, and oh, there, there are two Y's in there, so you see two letters. So I was going around, like, you know, they're setting up. And then that Sunday, Brand X guys are here, you know, t shirts. And it was like, apparently, you know, I showed up Saturday morning. You know, tell us, share my life. Ah, most shirts are really cool. She comes over and tells me. But so, really. And I saw one very good Oh, yeah. It's a really yeah. cool shirt. Um, I had a wedding yesterday. Thanks. So. Mm. You guys made it. Actually, it's <laughs> surprising I made it at all. You know, I'm like, okay, okay. So, you know, I told the so story about, the, about when it was made. I was drinking on the bill. And, you know, and I said, I, I represent the 8 bit. And I'm like, oh, dude, that'd be perfect for a t shirt. And it so happens, there's this place right over here that. Makes t shirts. Is that right, dude? We should get another shot. And then we should go make some t shirts. Went to the website. True technology in Arizona. I've had two other shirts made by them. I heard liver damage. Which is really open ended. There's so many things that cause liver damage. Most people assume alcohol. That's usually what I hear when I'm when sure I wear the right shirts. Like, is that a drinking oh, reference? But or, you know, know some other people, uh, painkillers, cocaine, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, um, um, we're too much it actually, it actually, they tried actually to was my doctor who wanted to put me on something that uh, could else, cause liver damage, yeah, so I had to bring it up. Yeah. I've used it in a lot of other contexts, but I wore it in the very next doctor meeting. Oh, there was no live stream. Some of the places. What's your liver doing? My shirt. Yeah, yeah, my shirt. Cool. How are you? Very good. This was interesting. you got to I was thinking about our size example of Steve Jobs and his presentations. I mean, that that was like I'm going to take care of him two and two and two and three. Yeah, they might not be done yet. Most places aren't, I don't think. Oh, it's a good point. He had an interesting balance. Steve Jobs had an interesting balance between.